Well, you don't remember those days. Definitely you? memorize. I <laughs> I'm going to ask um, Councilman um, Ross to uh, chair the meeting today. I cannot read. No. She, she can read. She just <laughs> her, her eyes have got some of those eye drops. Better than a road lizard. <laughs> 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 Then I'll bring this uh, recommending committee meeting to, uh, to order uh, today, May 1st, uh, uh, 2007. Has this meeting been posted uh, according to the Nevada State Open Meeting Law? Yes, it has. Um, we will uh, hear Bill number 2007-14, prohibits unruly gatherings and establishes regulations and penalties with respect thereto, sponsored by Councilman Wallace Harkany and Councilman Gary Reese. Uh, Councilman, did you want to? I was just going to say that um, uh, we had uh, discussed this previously and uh, feel that we, uh, we will hold table this because we want to polish it and to be sure that we're doing it as effectively as possible. Uh, I have not read today's paper, which may be good, <laughs> but I will say that this is an ordinance that's in effect in several cities throughout the United States. And um, we came to do it because of requests from people who live within um, my ward and the Councilman Reese's ward, and even Councilman Wilson today said they have problems. Primarily, it's to help residents. And that's what we were aiming for. And if we, uh, we want to be sure, however, that we're not covering anything that we did not intend to, and we want to make sure that we can take more time to work it out effectively. So we will be tabling this item. I will move to table this item. Mr. Chairman, we will allow public comment prior to table. I think so, Mr. Um, Mr. Jerby, you want to comment? It, it might, might help uh, anybody's comments. If, if okay. Staff makes a little bit of a report here first, but it's up to you. Uh, it just said, can he say it first and then you say it? Who? Brad Jerbic. Of course. If I, with your pleasure, Mr. McGowan, I'd like to, and, and members of uh, council, the, uh, the reason for tabling this this morning has nothing to do with this morning's newspaper article, which I think is unfortunate. It just reflects a, a lack of knowledge of what we've done here. So if I could just spend a moment, I would just like to let you know where we're at, how we uh, came to have this ordinance on your agenda, and what we expect to do after it's tabled today. Uh, several months ago, probably more than eight months ago, the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, through the captain of the downtown area command and others, approached the city uh, with an eye toward looking at an unruly gathering ordinance. It wasn't an ordinance that was drafted from whole cloth by the city of Las Vegas that had been on the books in other cities around the country, and I'll talk about that in just a moment, and a model ordinance had been drafted, which we were provided. This is an ordinance so that everybody knows it's not criminal, it's civil. It's an ordinance aimed only at residences, not commercial properties, and it's really aimed at, for want of a better term, party houses, where people have out-of-control binge parties sometimes where the police have to come in and a lot of public resources are used to take care of it. The individual, according to this ordinance, is for want of a better term, red tagged the first time they are caught in violation. In other words, if the police go out, they can issue a criminal citation for disturbing the peace if they wish. But if they also wish, neighborhood services of the city of Las Vegas can go out and issue a civil warning, a red tag, so to speak, indicating that this house has been the place of an unruly gathering that caused disturbance to neighbors and the like, and they have to cease and desist. That's what you get the first time. If within 180 days the conduct repeats itself, then neighborhood services can go back and issue a civil citation, which makes you liable for a penalty of up to $150 and reimbursement to Metro and the city for the cost of making us clean up your mess. So the taxpayers get their money back for doing this. Second time around, within 180 days, it's a $300 penalty. And third time around, within 180 days, it's $500. The individual doesn't like what's happening as a result of us responding. They can go to Neighborhood Services and appeal. And if they don't like the decision of Neighborhood Services, they go before the Las Vegas City Council on an agenda in the afternoon where we put chronic nuisances where people don't like how much money we're charging them to abate a nuisance. Somebody could complain that you're charging me too much to abate the problem I caused by my unruly gathering, and it would be up to the council to determine it. That, in a nutshell, is what this does. Anybody who says anything else simply hasn't read it and, and understand it. What I want to put in the record are a couple of things. One, the city of Tucson has had this ordinance on the books for at least a couple of years. Uh, they have published a 
pamphlet called Know the Law, City of Tucson's Unruly Gathering Ordinance Red Tagging. I'm putting that in the record because our ordinance is very, very, very close to what is on the books in Tucson. And I think this explanation that Tucson has put out is, is equally applicable to Las Vegas. I provided that to the clerk and that's part of the public record. I've also provided to the clerk the Ventura County Community Partnership for Responsible Alcohol Policies and Practices produced a model social host liability ordinance. That's what some people call it. Some people call it red tagging. Some people call it unruly gathering. Some people call it model social host liability ordinance, which is a lot more of a mouthful than uh, unruly gathering. But we read this thoroughly. We looked at the model ordinance, not created by the city of Las Vegas, not a whole cloth, and used it as a basis to draft ours. I have filed this model ordinance with the clerk and the paperwork that came with it, and it's also part of the public record. I have also given the clerk a copy of a Daily City California ordinance, which is their version of unruly gathering, and they call it loud or unruly gathering. It's been on the books there since it looks like 1991. That's correct, 1991 is, looks like when this was written. Uh, that is part of the public record, and anybody who wants to compare our ordinance to that may do so. I've also got a copy of the Santa Cruz ordinance. Santa Cruz, California, it looks like 1995, if I'm not mistaken, excuse me, 2005, adopted uh, an ordinance titled pertaining to security service charges at loud or unruly gatherings. That's part of the public record, and people can compare our ordinance to that one. And finally, I printed an intercept site for the city of, Hugh, uh, Hugh, uh, city of Tucson dealing with uh, a summary of their ordinance and the fine schedule, which by the way, our fines are less than theirs. Mr. McGowan, if you want copies of all those, I'll give you copies of I those at the minute. Much, yeah. the, uh, I, I think that there's been a lot of misconception when I hear stories like this is going to be used to bust up union picketers on sidewalks and this is going to be used to suppress speech. Uh, this is to be used for people who, for the most part, party excessively at their home and cause the police to come out over and over and over again. Does it mean it wouldn't be used just one time? Hopefully you only have to use it once and they get the message and don't do it again. But if they don't, it provides a series of stepped up civil penalties and notice to allow that person to correct their conduct and allows the money that we the taxpayers spend to end these kinds of unruly gatherings to be reimbursed to the taxpayer. That's my presentation. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. I think you've answered all my questions. I'm interested uh, in regards to you doing some homework on some other localities that have the same challenges we do as the city of Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. uh, it's unfair to taxpayers to, uh, to burden them with uh, the cleanup of some of these um, party houses. And, and I, you know, attending college in, in, in Nevada, I think I have an idea of, of what you mean by this by this ordinance and councilwoman. Um, whenever we have an opportunity to save the taxpayers a few dollars, especially recover fines for the use of our Metropolitan Police Department. Uh, when they actually need to be out, out there catching the bad days and not driving over to, to little Junior's house to break up a party and clean up the yard. Um, that's a big concern of mine. But uh, uh, Councilwoman has made a motion to, to table this. Um, I'm gonna hold that for a moment, Councilwoman, until we hear some comment. Uh, from the public, I certainly want to, want to hear the public's comments. Please state your name for the record. Limit your comments to three minutes, please. Go ahead. Yes, I am Juanita Clark, and I am representing Charleston Neighborhood Preservation, um, which goes from um, Buffalo to Decatur between Washington and Charleston. Um, there's been a paper submitted. Was that only to the only to to you? Are you the only one that, rece re that received that? Okay. I'll pass. I'll, would you like I'll to submit pass. something for the record? What you'd uh, like to I, do? I will. I will. But I want to. I want to to verbalize it also. Um, uh, it's been stated here by our attorney that um, that if we have a complaint, we haven't read it, haven't understood it. And so my comment to that is, it needs to be very clear. It needs to be very clear to, if this is a law that I am to abide by, I need to be able to understand it. And um, so it should be very clear. 
And it certainly is not. As we submitted before on April 3rd, that there's no definition for unruly. And also there wasn't a timeline for appeal, this type of thing. It just is not clear. And so in reading what the board, the ones that signed it, have submitted, is this bill is a statement by elected representatives that rather than acting on behalf of the residents of this city, requests power to use a tax-paid law enforcement to, if an officer wishes, declare a person or persons unruly, meaning not submissive to anything to which the officer responding to a call determines unruly to portray. Because truly, that's a free call. If somebody comes to my house, if somebody comes to my neighbor's house with an identical thing, depending on what the person feels, I could be pronounced an unruly, having an unruly party at my home, or an unruly situation. So it's an absolutely open call to just whatever the feeling is at the time. We feel that this is a defiant, trashing, unruly, depraved, and corrupt attack on residents who, according to law, can expect elected representatives to preserve their rights as declared in our Constitution. And that this is not being done, it's just, it's very, it's very, if, have you read it, Councilwoman Tarkanian? Yes, I did read it. And Councilman Ross? Well, and Ms. Clark, if I can make a comment to your comments. Keep in mind, Councilwoman has asked to obey this item so that the city attorney's office can work all of those issues out. And I would suggest to you, because you have some valid comments, that you leave those comments with the clerk. I think you've already submitted that for the record, so that the city attorney has time to review that. I, for one, and this is just myself speaking on behalf of my position with this council and this recommending committee, there are other cities that have enacted an ordinance such as this for certain reasons. I want ours to be better. I certainly don't want our laws to violate anyone's civil rights. This isn't, in my opinion, and I will never allow an encroachment upon your residences and your homes in regards to violating any laws. That would not be due diligence on my part as an elected official in the city of Las Vegas, and I think Councilwoman feels the same way. So the reason she has obeyed this is so that we can have time to review this and clearly define it. And I'm going to make a suggestion to you that you save your comments and be prepared again for the next recommending committee when this is heard again, so we can hear all of these concerns and they can be addressed at that time. The only pay I have is that we have very good government, and what I would like to see is a comparison then of the comments that were made by residents in these places, not something that elected people do. But I would like to continue, if I may. Thank you. Two people can emit higher decibels than one. Why are proposals to cut open space by more than 10,000 feet and roads narrowed as tweakings to increase the number of apartments per acre? Why are liquor licenses requested where they infringe on lawful boundaries of schools, churches, and child care? Are these items requested on the city council agendas not unruly? May I state the preamble to the Constitution? Just the preamble is enough to spotlight the tragic waste, the debasement of intellect, resources, and liberties which defaces the nine pages of this bill, 2007-14, which incidentally was also back in September, it was stricken, and then again on April 3rd, and it was held, and maybe even prior to September. I'm not sure, but that was the case then. The preamble, and my grandchildren can all recite this without reading it, I'm going to read it. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Do the two council persons sponsoring this bill, 2007-14, formerly 2006-54, that was in September, and on the council agenda tomorrow as item 58, and so I'm curious what's going to happen with that because it is on the agenda to be read. So is that going to be read anyway? No, it was on the agenda before. We don't, these are, it will not be read to be heard by the council tomorrow. Okay. Go ahead, please, I'm sorry. Okay. 
<clears throat> we, we, we truly believe that this is, uh, is, is, is uh, it has no validity at all on the, uh, for, for, for more than a beyond, beyond this for a nanosecond. And respectfully, we request that this bill, 2007-14, receive a no vote uh, and that the intentions in stated in this bill never again be sponsored by any legal representative of the people and then it's signed by some of the board members of our, of our neighborhood group. Um, we cannot believe that any person that's representing um, residents would have such um, a type of, a, a, type of a, a bill as this. Thank, thank you. Thank you. If I might, Mr. Councilman, uh, because uh, Ward 1 uh, is where Juanita Clark lives and I represent Ward 1, and because I was a co-sponsor of this bill, I would like to state very clearly, and I would be glad to give anybody, just give me a little time to gather the information to let you know of the families where the women have actually cried over the telephone to me, and where they, where they have a sick member of the family, and uh, they have no, no way to, to, to get this noise to stop, and that when they try and talk to the people, the women tell me they're scared. They're scared because of the answers that are given to them. This is to protect residents this emanated from residents. This is not some superimposing by some elected official. This came from residents at the requests of residents and almost at the begging of some residents. And I just want that on the record. Thank you, Thank you Council. Well, I'm, I'm going to decide with you on that. I deal with the same similar situations out in the Northwest where we have uh, no laws governing this. Um, obviously, my comments were going to be before you made that comment is, there's obviously a problem out there that needs to be addressed, and we need to find a, a, a solution to it. Um, so as uh, I'm going to we need to improve what we have, and that's why we have recommending committee and other things, so we can take the views of everybody. You have recommending so you can polish and uh, do this the right way. Mr. Yeah. Mr. McGowan, please state your name for the record. John McGowan, Las Vegas resident. Without being facetious, it's apparent the city attorney's exhausted presentation includes everything but a public apology to the alleged perpetrators. Maybe that's forthcoming, I don't know. In contrast, it's reasonable to assume any group of two or more persons engaged in unlawful activity is an unruly gathering. Examples include hundreds of truants engaged in a political demonstration supportive of illegal aliens, which is illegal, and disrupting vehicular traffic. Crowded First Fridays engaged in a political demonstration. No, excuse me. Crowded First Fridays in the arts district includes about underage drinking, public nuisance, violation of city codes, vandalism, ADA non-compliance, armed robbery, and the discontinuation of public mass transit services. As used in the bill, the term prohibits implies mandatory investigation and prosecution in accordance with applicable law. I recommend a policy of zero tolerance in the best public interest inclusively. And pertinent public officials should be held responsible, accountable, and liable to the full extent of the law. Balanced status as a world-class city requires a population comprised of world-class public and private sectors and that requires world-class official leadership to set a positive role model example rather than one that contributes to the decline of the community standard of decency throughout society and government. This is a much bigger issue than it looks like in the presentation and in the bill itself. It's talking about the current state, the quotient of quality of this community and everybody in it. Sure, there are differences in opinion, but there's only one right one. You must decide which one and act upon it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Green. Anyone else wish to speak on this item? Good afternoon. My name is Lee Rowland. I'm the staff attorney for the ACLU of Nevada. Um, I realize this item is in advance. I've just learned that. Um, I'd like to review the materials that Mr. Durbick has prepared on the other jurisdictions, and uh, if, if he likes, we'd be happy to submit something with if he's willing to consider it or not about our concerns about the bill. A as it's currently written, um, we do have concerns that this is an unduly vague ordinance. 
uh, unruly gathering is, is a gathering of two more persons, which causes a disturbance of the quiet enjoyment of any public or private property. Um, and that is not limited or defined in any way. Certain examples are given, and, and even in those enumerated examples, we certainly have concerns that this encompasses behavior that is non-criminal um, and which does not give adequate notice to residents about what kind of behavior they can engage in. For instance, um, drinking in public, as far as I know, um, it is not against Las Vegas City Code to have a beer on your front lawn. Um, but under this ordinance now, two people having a beer on their front lawn would be per se an unruly ordinance um, under this definition. I, I, I can't hold my tongue off. Yeah. That is so patently wrong, I'd like to address it at the very end. Um, also, it says vandalism, littering, which again are a little confusing because this is on a private residential property. So I'm wondering, you know, if somebody is littering on their own property, if that could be included. Um, it may not be intended that way or enforced that way, but certainly as it reads, it does affect activities on public property that it, at this point we believe um, it's unduly vague and doesn't give residents notice as to what their behavior is. And again, I have to repeat, these are uh, just examples. The entire definition is any disturbance of quiet enjoyment of public or private property, which is a very expansive definition and it leaves complete discretion to the enforcement officers. Um, since obviously this is something that involves a civil infraction for residents, we would really like to see this language tightened up, um, perhaps limit it to criminal behavior, uh, like a, an obstructing the peace, or disturbing the peace, excuse me, ordinance, set out noise levels. It, there are certainly ways to make this a specific ordinance that targets all the behavior that's been set out as problematic behaviors without, I think, incurring the kind of concerns from residents that all of a sudden they're going to have a picnic and the cops are going to show up and they're all going to be arrested. So we don't have any uh, objection to the underlying uh, issue, but I think right now as it reads, it's vague, and because, of course, this is going to be complaint-driven, uh, this could literally give uh, the Hatfields and the McCoys an official government tool to enforce private disputes, and there's no question under this law that it, that it does do that. Um, and I'm certainly mindful, Councilwoman Tarkinian, that there are people in your ward, as you just mentioned, who are so frustrated. I would hope that disturbing the peace ordinances currently apply to that kind of behavior. Um, if the intent of this law is simply to recoup some taxpayer money, that's certainly a goal that can be accomplished, we think, with some narrower language that, that simply attaches those two together without kind of having this vague standard that seems to criminalize, or not criminalize, but put a civil penalty on almost any kind of noise made by two or more people because of course quiet enjoyment is a very subjective term and quiet enjoyment um, certainly while nice is probably not enough of an adequate standard on which to base civil enforcement and <coughs> actually fining people quite substantial amounts of money. So uh, in part because of the complaint of the nature of this and the possibility for abuse among neighbors who may have private feuds. I think it's really crucial to have some specific language in this so this just isn't arbitrarily enforced. And I certainly think there are ways to write this that can accomplish the goals of the council and, and your residents, obviously. So as I said, we'd be happy to look over um, the other laws that Mr. Jurvik cited, but to be frank, the fact that other jurisdictions have laws which we believe are unconstitutionally vague doesn't dissuade us from thinking that this one has problems as well. So um, I certainly would urge the council to vote no on this one as written and ask the city attorney's office to tighten up this language to address specific behavior. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Jerby. Uh, if there's somebody else that wants to speak on it, I'd just like to address a couple of those comments. One, that it, it's saying stuff like two people drinking a beer in the front yard can be arrested under this. That causes people to write articles in newspapers that are just inaccurate to the public and an inflamed sense of, of what people are trying to do in government to protect residences from, from these party houses. If you drink two beer on your front yard, you're not in violation of this law. There's nothing here that says that. Two people disturbing the beast drinking beer in your front yard could trigger it, absolutely. But two people could trigger it right now under existing law. And if you want to talk about a Hatfield versus McCoy situation, there are plenty of laws on the books right now that deal with disturbing the beast that are criminal in nature. And if you wanted to abuse it and call on your neighbor every day, you could. This doesn't do any more than that is already there. Again, this isn't criminal, this is civil, and, and I heard the word criminal used more than once. This is merely an additive item to laws that exist already that allows you to impose an additional civil penalty, and more importantly, recoup the cost of enforcement involving going to these houses over and over again. 
We're not standing here recommending that you adopt it or not adopt it. It was brought to us as one more tool, and we've drafted it to give to you. Uh, I will take the troll on, on, on her offer. I, I can tell you, looking through the various ordinances that I intend to provide you at the end of the meeting, there, there are many ways to skin a cat here. You can express the term unruly gathering in, in the terms that we've used, which we think are just fine. You can add language that somebody might think is tighter, and, and that may be fine, but, I, but keep in mind, you're not going to ever please everybody at the table with every single word that you write, and everybody's going to say we are all on the same page. Mr. Steve and I had a discussion earlier today. If you look at many of our ordinances, including our existing disparity of peace ordinance and the standards, anybody could argue it doesn't give me enough clarity. The uh, the fact of the matter is sometimes you only know when a court tells you one way or the other, and sometimes you just have to rely on the research you've done and other jurisdictions have done. I'm quite comfortable with the language that's in here right now. I'm not saying it's the only language. I'm not saying it can't be refined and, and, and defined a little bit more. Um, but what I will do is I'll provide all these to the ACLU. Keep in mind those people read them. <coughs> slightly different variations. Some cities say a gathering of three or more instead of two or more. Some you know, express you know, very specifically what you have to do, cause excessive noise, excessive traffic. Of course, you can write all those things in an ordinance, and somebody can say, what's the word excessive mean? But at some point in time, you just have to get your arms around it enough to feel comfortable enough that a reasonable person using the reasonable person standard, which is recognized in law, understands it, and then decide whether or not it's an ordinance that you want to adopt. But we'll be happy to talk to the ACLU or anybody else who wishes to send us information, making suggested changes, uh, we'll be glad to consider it. Well, I think, uh, thank you, Mr. Jerbeck. Thank you, everyone, for your comments. Uh, and Councilman, if I might comment myself, it's a great thing about uh, democracy. And as we move forward to enhance the quality of life in our neighborhoods for the residents of this city. It's challenging for us at times uh, because of perception. And we're trying to do the right things and move forward and, and protect our families and protect our neighborhoods. And sometimes it's difficult to, to reach that goal and continue to please everybody. But I'm grateful for the comments that were shared here. Uh, I know Councilwoman, uh, you and uh, Councilman Reese will work with the City Attorney's Office. Um, there's a motion on the floor to table this uh, item. You want to table it? I mean, uh, obey this for 30 days? Yeah, Councilman, is it? Councilman, I would just recommend tabling, and, and for this tabling. reason, so the public okay. knows, um, this will come back at some point in time for resolution. But I know that there's a new sheriff in town, so to speak, and a new captain in charge of the downtown area command. If I knew for a fact we could all sit down in 30 days and address all these comments, Great. I would say 30. But if you simply table, we'll bring it back and we'll get through all those meetings. Councilwoman, are you obliged to that? That's what I would want to do, yes. I would like to add that um, you're giving copies of everything you had to the people who came here to speak, right? Does yes, so I've made part of the public record those, and I've had enough copies just to give Mr. McGowan and Ms. Rowland copies. Uh, if, if, if anybody else would like some, I'll be glad to make more upstairs. I think Mike want copies also. I think, I think our people would like them. No problem. I'll tell you what I'll do is while you're going through the items on the agenda, I'll make more copies and come back down. Then the, wait, before, uh, uh, if I could just add something else too. And then those uh, from Ms. Clark and uh, Tom and, and also from ACLU, if you could look at those and write specifically what your suggestions are to tighten up the language. And I, I think you're seeing a balance in what we're trying to do. And uh, if you could uh, give that to us, then we can include it in, uh, as we go through. And then I know Brad will also be doing that too. Mm -hmm. Can I ask one question? Uh, I'm wondering, is it your intent to have this law um, allow for civil penalties for criminal enforcement only, or are you looking to expand the definition to behavior that is not currently criminal? Because I think that would change the comments we would submit. Uh, because right now I think my main concern with it is the areas that it covers that aren't criminal. So for instance, when someone is not disturbing the peace, um, how this would be applied to them. So I'm wondering what your intent is. So that you can Could I, my intent is to help <coughs> the residents. Uh, I'm not the legal expert here. Could you answer that, Mr. I, I could. This definition does not uh, match word for word the definition of disturbing the peace, which is the criminal law. That's one option the council has. This is written broader than that to encompass more behavior than that, but it's not criminalizing it. It's not adding a new criminal law with a broader definition. It's saying there's more things we can get paid back for and you can get civilly fined for than just exist in the disturbing the peace law. And you can narrow that, you could, t you could, t you could trim that back, or you could expand it. It's purely a policy call. I'd just like to say that one of the things we found in neighborhood services where people didn't let their houses go in great disrepair and they were sided and sided and we really didn't get much action on their part. The other residents on the street were saying, you know, look, here we're working hard and what's happening there? Why doesn't the city do something? 
And then what the city did do was they would red tag it, and then they would have the accelerated, you know, uh, and, and it's working. It's, we're getting more response and more people paying attention to fit in within a neighborhood than we've had before. And I don't mean you have to fit in exactly, but there are certain standards within the neighborhoods. And that's why we thought this might help in this too. But mainly the idea behind it is to help those residents who are, you know, they can't get the police in time, or uh, the police are here now and then they're not there, and, and, and they want help, they want help. But I liked your comments and I hope you give it to us in writing and going over anything else you see, and also Anita and Tom. There's a motion on the floor to table, Bill number 2007-14, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Agenda uh, item four, Bill number 2007-15, levies assessment for special improvement district 1485, Alta Drive, Rancho Drive, approximately 270 feet west of Lacey Lane, landscape maintenance, fiscal year 2008, sponsored by the step requirement, staff. Uh, yeah, thank you, Councilman. Uh, Mike Thompson, Department of Public Works. Uh, this ordinance allows us to uh, continue funding the ongoing maintenance along the Alta Drive corridor. Uh, there are approximately 30, or there's 37 property owners that are involved in this district, and they fund that maintenance 100% uh, uh, through the special assessment. And I can answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Uh, I don't have any questions except there are two houses. The plants are all dead and fronted, so I hope that we can take <laughs> care of those. <laughs> Get on that right away. I keep telling everybody they're just waiting to see if some little green <coughs> sprouts come up. And then the, but uh, I don't have any questions. Okay, anyone in the public wish to speak on that? Okay. Um, I work closely with the individuals here, and I would move to approve. Move to refer to council to do pass? Yes. Is that, is that the motion? That's what I mean. Uh, there's a motion to move to send the council to do pass on agenda. Item 4, bill number 2007-15. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, bill passed. Uh, bill is moved to council. Am I saying that right? <laughs> Close enough. Okay. Agenda uh, 5, bill number 2007-16, annexation number ANX10156, property location within the area bounded by Clark County Highway 215 on the east, Washburn Road on the south, Pulley Road on the west, and Centennial Parkway on the north. Petition by Southwest Desert Equities, LLC. Acreage approximately 245 acres, zone RU, U, U, and U. <laughs> City equivalents, sponsored by Councilman Steve G. Cross. Um, um, the direct planning director is not going to be with us today. Val, did you want to make a comment about yes, this? Yes, uh, this is a uh, one of the rare long form annexations that we do. It's 100% uh, owner petition, but or, or if not petitioned, consented to, but because of the, the uh, state law and how it addresses contiguity and, and acreage, we had to go through the long process. You had a, an annexation report, you had a public hearing. This is just uh, finalizing the deal, adopting the ordinance, um, and setting an effective date. So we recommend approval. Council? Move to. Uh Send forward to the council with the recommendation of due pass. There's a motion to send the council with due pass. Any comments from the public? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, Bill moves forward to council. <laughs> um, agenda item six, Bill 2007 <coughs> 17, Town Center Development Standards <coughs> Manual to allow consignment sales in the GC TC and SC TC zoning districts by means of special use permit. As a limited number of second, as a limited type of secondhand dealer sponsored by Councilman Steve Ross. Um, you I guess that's me. Again. You want to talk uh, on that one? Uh, the town center has its own uh, use standards, and uh, the consignment sales is not allowed out there. Uh, rather than create a new category, licensing already recognizes secondhand dealer, so we are adopting the manual. Understanding that you aren't going to want typical secondhand dealers out there, and so the conditions reflect the very limited type of use that will be allowed. Uh, it has to go through the use permit process with uh, specified minimum conditions. And I'm sure that the sponsor of this bill, as well as planning, would recommend that. And, Councilman, just to bring you up to speed on this, when he talked about um, uh, putting 
putting uh, limitations on what they can do as a second-hand dealer, we certainly did. This has to do with uh, uh, consignment furniture uh, sales. Um, and rather than rewrite this, we just put a, a great deal of limitations on what these folks can do. And I certainly don't want them coming out of the woodwork. You and I both know uh, we have way too many second-hand dealer type um, businesses in the, in the city of Las Vegas, uh, mainly pawn shops, and that's my opinion only, Councilwoman, but uh, um, they are legitimate businesses allowed by our code, and uh, um, I would uh, recommend that you move this on the council. I move, I'll wait. Thank you. Um, here from the, the pub, public comment. Tom McGowan, Las Vegas resident. I just want one simple question to the subjective nature of uh, this item, well, many other items uh, that come before these bodies. What's the difference between a uh, traditional or, or a typical second-hand dealer and a uh, non-typical? Where is that to express anyway in concrete terms? And if not, why not? Uh, that's the end of my question. You not respond. It's just something to uh, mull over as you address all of these items of similar subjective uh, potential uh, content. Because to one person means this, the other person means that. There is a, uh, for example, I don't know you have three months street uh, experience uh, directly adjacent to Walgreens drugstore and uh, across Neonopolis in the so-called dead zone between 4th and 5th Street, nevertheless actively populated with people from all over, is a, uh, a typical gypsy caravan <laughs> web. If you know anything about gypsies, particularly typical gypsies, you need to take a close look at that, very close look, before it begins to look at you in the news headlines. And that's all I'll say today. But you can bet there's a big story in that. Take my word for that. And if, if you're not prepared to do that, just wait and see. And be, be sure you send a combo at that time. But you have a dance notice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McGowan. Any other comments on this agenda? Um, with that, Councilwoman. I move to forward this to the City Council with the Dupass recommendation. A motion for Dupass to Council on agenda item 6, bill number 2007 17. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, motion goes to Council. Um, agenda item 7, bill number 2007 18 requires a certain, requires in certain buildings a minimum level of support for radio coverage for emergency service personnel sponsored by Councilman Steve Ross. And boy, we worked hard on this. Yes. Um, I was hoping to see someone in fire or building here, but I will do my best. You, you know what? They just know we're doing good things. And trust us. Uh, this would apply to uh, any building four stories and more than four stories in height, uh, with the exception of single-family homes, which I don't believe we have too many four-story, five-story single-family homes. Uh, requires that they be able to accomplish certain kinds of communication <coughs> by reason of their radio coverage. Um, it applies to all new construction um, upon construction. It applies to all existing construction upon notice from the city to comply and uh, existing uh, structures would be given one year or whatever other time was specified in notice to comply. As you know, this was uh, discussed both formally and Formally with representatives of the development industry. A uh, business impact statement was prepared to reflect the fact that they had been given the opportunity to uh, submit input. And so we recommend approval. Yeah. If I can comment uh, first, Mr. McGowan, Councilwoman, um, this, this ordinance, this bill, uh, is, is in response to several things, namely communication issues involving. 911 incident uh, in New York City and the inability for emergency personnel to communicate with one another. Um, I work very closely as well as the city staff with uh, associated general contractors and all of the um, significant players in construction and uh, 
also with Metro and with fire services. Uh, and, and everybody was on the same page. It was a remarkable thing to see uh, when it came to public safety and saving the lives of individuals who may be in a building where there may be an emergency occurring. Uh, everybody was just fabulous. So I really wish to send my appreciation. I wish more staff was here, Val, and, uh, and I can say that to you and they can hear my words that uh, I appreciate them. And, and Mr. Riggerman, I see you here today as our director of communications. Should this should this be approved at the council level, I would certainly like to uh, to make sure that uh, the uh, news uh, the news is notified in regards to our efforts to create a much more safety friendly environment in the city of Las Vegas. So if that press release could take place, should it be approved, I'd appreciate that. And uh, Mr. McGinn, I'll open up the public public uh, comment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Tom McGowan, Las Vegas man. I'll preface my remarks with your indulgence with two very simple questions. Uh, first question, Mr. Chairman, what is your professional occupation? I am an electrician. Thank you. And uh, anybody, how many stories was the Ms. Pa Hotel in Reno? Well, I'm going to guess four? Four or less. Wouldn't have come under this, but it should. So the uh, number of stories is relevant depending upon whether you're in the fire or not. Thank you. And uh, now for my comments. Historically, the term minimum is expediently subject to construal as a maximum. I recommend the bill include provision for a discretionary upside open end maximum with a reasonable limitation. And uh, uh, by way of reference, for you, uh, for you, the review, typically labor unions that negotiate contracts and demand a minimum uh, standard of a wage or minimum conditions, minimum requirements. Typically, the employers, as uh, according to their best wisdom, they adopt those minimums, never exceed them. There should be a uh, room for discretionary latitude to exceed the minimums. And I would also uh, uh, finalize with the uh, reminder, respectful reminder, the communications in that 9-11 were not limited to inside the building. The absent communications were from outside the inside. Nobody outside could tell anybody inside the building is coming down. <coughs> so it came down. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, anyone else public comment? The council? I move that this be forwarded to the City Council with the recommendation of due pass. Thank you, Councilman. On bill number 2007-18, there's been a motion to refer to Council with a due pass. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the uh, bill moves forward. Uh, bill number 2007-19 authorizes the issuance of local improvement district bond series 2007 for an amount not to exceed $1,724,000 for Special Improvement District 1506, Fremont Street Pedestrian Improvements, Las Vegas Boulevard and 8th Street, proposed by Mark Vincent, Director of Finance and Business Services. Mr. Hutchins, is that yours? Um, I, I can do it. This is part of the Local Improvement District Bond uh, that's related to the Fremont Street Pedestrian Improvements, and it's part of the process we go through to um, to get to a position where we can sell, issue and sell the bonds. And it's in there. And staff's recommendation? Do, do pass. Okay. Um, public, public comment? Yes. Tom McGowan, Las Vegas resident, as previously stated, the design review committee, the historic preservation committee, and other public agencies, 14 of the 18 historic commemorative medallions and placed in the pedestrian sidewalk are incorrect, incomplete, and are not directly relatable to any of the private properties located in Fremont East. If approved, the bill constitutes malfeasance of public office and misfeasance of public funds on the part of all public officials and city employees directly and indirectly causal love and contributed to the bill, which at best is grossly at variance with that, and in the worst case scenario, constitutes misrepresentation, fraud, extortion, and expedient service to all these subjective agenda at both public and private expense, and adversely impacted on the genuine best 
public entrance. God forbid anybody ever ask, who is Jackie Gunn? Who is Mel Expert? And why aren't their names on the sidewalk in three months? And for your ad, for edification, when Newt never appeared anywhere east of 30 and three months, ever, nor did Frank Sinatra. And the atomic bomb well, did not, was not detonated anywhere in the city of Pennsylvania on our Federal Reserve land, 100 miles to the northwest at a place appropriately called Jackass Flats. Thank you. Anyone else for public comment? Uh, hearing none, Councilman? Uh, we did have some questions on this, and I think that uh, some more will be perhaps asked tomorrow. I'd just like to uh, move to, we uh, forward this to the Council with no recommendation, and then let each Council member vote their conscience. Okay, that's the motion uh, to forward to City Council with no recommendation. Council, is that yeah, the motion? Because then they can each determine what they feel is best. All right. Well, and I and I have some questions, and that was why I felt that it'd be good if we all had a chance to determine what was best. Okay, that's the motion. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. Refers to Council with no with with no recommendation. Bill number, agenda item 9, Bill number 2007-20, annexation uh, number 19561, property location south side of Deer Springs, way approximately 330 feet west of Grand Canyon Drive. Uh, petition, petition by Dark LLC, eight, um, acreage is 5.1 acres, zone RE, uh, county zoning U, city equivalent, sponsored by Councilman Steve Ross. This is a standard uh, owner requested annexation. Uh, apparently, it's kind of close to a large one we did earlier, and uh, it was thought that it would be good to uh, kind of square things up, so we were kind of cool. Thank you. We're just gobbling it up as quick as we can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any uh, public comment on this agenda? Yeah, John McGowan, I'll speak as recommended to pass. Mr. McGowan, Councilman, any thoughts, comments? No, I know that if you recommend this and you have all that land you can gobble up, that it's, it's sort of nice, I guess. Thank you, Councilman. Like taking that as a motion. Oh, no, right. I, I will make the motion <laughs> now, and that is to move to Council with the due pass recommendation. Uh, there's a motion made to refer to Council with the due pass on uh, Bill number 2007-20. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none. Bill forwards to City Council. Agenda item 10 is this is participation. Public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters of the jurisdiction of the committee. No subject may be acted upon by the committee unless the subject is on agenda and scheduled for action. <coughs> you wish to be heard, please state your name for the record. Tom McGowan, Las Vegas resident. Extemporaneous only. Oral. I, I would uh, respectfully remind the uh, two members of this very important committee and all public officials, elected, appointed, and city employees. There are seven members on the city council. Not one, not two, not eight or nine. Uh, among those seven members, the uh, predisposition to vote their conscience, to speak their mind, is absolutely imperative the integrity of government. And government without integrity is the essence of anarchy. I would also respectfully remind that all members of the city council, including but not limited to the members of this committee, a simple majority is all that's required to override the action or inaction of the, any one or more members of the council less than that means you have the responsibility, the moral imperative, to not only think very carefully about every item that goes down, whether it's in your district or not, in your ward or not, because you vote on all items. But to think about the public interest and uh, your part and role in that. And if necessary, stand up and be counted and take that risk. Because unless you do, it's conceivable this city is lost. I don't say that idly, but with due consideration, very careful consideration, the way things are going down, that you're either not consciously aware of or not uh, proceeding of as uh, having any uh, compelling
compelling immediacy. But there are things going on that make this a worse place to live by the minute. I'm not simply talking about drive by shooting, but families without husbands in the home, children without proper care by anybody, mental situations, overcrowded prison system. We are in a dire situation. And I would say, hazard the opinion, if Al Qaeda knew this, they'd be here in five minutes, except for one thing. Where are they going to park? <laughs> so, with that little bit of levity, I'll leave you with the broader strokes on the last comment. I concur with the councilwoman, Jack Kenyon, about voting your conscience. Absolutely. I'm sure you both will. And now it's up to you. Prove or disprove my belief in you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGuire. Any other comments? Um, thank you, Councilwoman, for letting me share this meeting with you today. Definitely learning experience. This meeting's adjourned. <laughs>